Oh, what is up, down, and sideways? You love individuals. We are back. It is Lee Gumbo here at Mark Ruthie Beauties with a little, a bit of a hiatus, but we're back for a better late than never global power rankings for week nine as we start winding down uh, the regular seasons in LCK. It's the final week. LPL, it's the final week and a half. And LEC, final week of split two. See, they all line up so beautifully. You know, it's kind of like, what is that meme of, you know, where does this puzzle piece fit into? Is it this hole or this hole? And they all go in the square hole. Every single one of them fits in there. That's kind of how it seems. Doesn't matter when you start your split. Doesn't matter if you've got three splits. We're slamming them all together. We're going to find a time where we are syncing up. And that is getting pretty close to us as we get closer to the end of these splits towards our MSI tournament where everyone's going to meet. And we're going to have a real chance to start to weigh some of these power rankings and what we're seeing. And you've got a whole handful of teams making a last second dash towards the end to get into this top 20. We got three, four teams that were not on here last week. A couple of them haven't been on here all split long, starting with, remember LNG? They're a team in the LPL that has a couple time MVP in the mid lane. Three game win streak. They beat IG during it, beat anyone's legend. It's it's good enough to get them on here. I'm not ready to say this This team's coming for you in playoffs. I don't think anybody is ready to say that about LNG, and especially the LNG that we have seen this year, this iteration of the roster and how they've been able to implement themselves against the other challenges in the LPL as you laid out a couple of recent successes for them is really where you're getting this little boost back in the stock where they find themselves back into this conversation, back into this picture, talking about them and what they offer. You laid out Scout, the MVP, of course, in the mid lane. I think the other big thing that you've been looking at this past little, you know, two week, you know, week and a half type of stretch is Gala down in the bottom lane. I think he's been a little bit more active, a little bit more activated for this LNG team. And that's going to be a request requirement if they're going to be a challenger for some of these top tier teams in the LPL is having a, a engine a horse like your man Gala in the bottom lane galloping down to the enemy nexus the opposite end of that the LPL world elite we were they're slowly creeping towards top 10 and all of a sudden we get a three game losing streak including series losses to rare Adam culminating with a 0-2 series loss to Thunder Talk so they Maybe LNG grabbed them on their tumble off the top 20 mountain and said, come on, guys, you got this. Prince, you know, redeem yourself, my guy. We believe in you. I think that is one of the players that I wanted to talk about when you're looking about this little bit of a slide for WE. I think that Prince has been someone that's been targeted maybe a little bit more than in the earlier times of this year. I think he's been someone that I haven't seen that type of performance that has been lifting up. This WE squad, I think the other player that you can look at is like someone in the way as wayward up in the top side. I think what he has been doing kind of to reestablish himself as a starting playing starting spot in the top lane in the LPL. He's done a little bit to shore that up this year and especially with some solid performances with WE. If they're going to get to that next level, if they're going to maintain this dark horse label because they're now starting to get into that territory where you might have that name knocked off of you and knocked out of the playoff picture altogether for the LPL that needs to come around for me is that top side strength that wayward has been able to show and re-show for the a lot of the people that doubted what we saw from him last time out with top esports a couple of western squads ahead of them after their tumble team liquid competitive five game set against FlyQuest, and follow that up with a statement 3-0 stomp over dignitas to keep their playoff hopes alive and team heretics are one of like six teams in the LEC that because these weeks are so short, I still don't know if they're good or bad at four and two. It's one of the most impossible things that we're coming to terms with was we understand the three split scheduling of the LEC and especially way those splits play out where you have these first, you know, one, three weeks where it is this regular season type formatting, round robining, all these type of things. And then we're immediately into the best of rounds, moving on, knocking teams out of contention for that split it's so hard to get that type of read on these teams from the lec and especially as we move into these next splits where you're trying to compound what you had in the split before with this split with week to week all these type of things when you still have that question mark there's been enough interest i will say enough sparkles from this heretics team that i think there's something here to work with 
whether we're going to see that thing to work with expanded upon and taken to that next level in these best of series for the LEC. That's the question. And the question for Kwangdong is, where have they been? Where's this D-plus Kia series Kwangdong been? They have a 6K comeback against D-plus and then a pretty convincing win in game two. Quantum subs in for this one. And this is the team we wanted to see in playoffs. They've just been gone for two months. It's taken way, way too long to get this coming through from the Kwangdong Freaks. And certainly one of those ones where to have this type of potential, right? You know, I think a lot of people identified that heading into this split for the LCK and to not take those strides. I think a lot of that still also comes, yes, down to the players, but as well, you got to give it to the coaching staff. That's one of those ones where we're, we're always praising someone like CV Max for what he's able to get out of his players. But when you're seeing these downsides, you got to be also looking at how you're getting out of it. I don't know how they did it, but they absolutely got it done in the time where it matters most, making it interesting for that playoff spot in the LCK. NIP stops their slide tumble out of the top 20, but last two series wins against RNG and Thunder Talk. That's the equivalent of walking up to a baseball diamond with a T-ball, smashing a home run and, sit and walking off, dropping your bat. You're like, yeah, but guys, it wasn't impressive. Well, I'll, I'll just let you guys in on, on a bad bad lesson from my past. I, I struck out when I was three or four at T-ball. Yeah, that's possible. So even then, you do get one point for hitting it off the T-ball thing. You got to get something in my books. And that is where NIP find themselves. And that one point is what stops the slide, stops them from moving out of a dark horse type of territory. Yes, they're a little bit higher up than where you find WE, but I think they're both more or less finding themselves in that same type of category, same type of conversation for where you're expecting, what type of power level you can view from them, what type of difficulty they can provide for some of these higher ranked teams in the OPO playoffs. And obviously striking out at T-ball hasn't plagued you or sat with you decades <laughs> later and completely influenced your life, right? No, I just had my, my friend's dad yelling at me, of course. And you know what? Hey, at the end of the day, I can't blame him because who the heck strikes out at T-ball? Yeah. Come on. It was a short-lived baseball career for Mark. You know, <laughs> eh, peaked and valleyed off to there. Uh, a couple LCS squads. It finally happened. The real Cloud9 showed up and, you know, absolutely dismantled 100 Thieves. They had a 10K gold lead in every single game. It was not close. Everyone, I mean, this team straight up looked like a totally different squad than we saw except for the first week in the regular season. It's like looking at a house that's turned on maybe one light, you know, in the front of the house. Maybe there's one in the bedroom on another weekend or something like that. Now we're seeing it. It's got the full light display. We got the lights outside the, the house. Christmas light lights. Oh my God. Yeah. They got the lights lining up the lineway right up to the front door. Everything is pris is is perfect and crystal clear from, from Cloud9 and what we have from them this past couple of weeks. This has been the Cloud9 that we've built it as, that everyone has talked about. You go all the way through this lineup. You have Fudge reestablishing himself as one of the top options in the top lane for the LCS, saying, you know what? Might have been a slump, might have been however you want to categorize it last year, but I am back with vengeance and I am looking to put my influence, my will out there on the rift. He's been doing that in that top side. Blabber, Jojo Pyun, mid jungle has been fantastic. Jojo Pyun dishing out that skill that we all know he was gonna bring to this Cloud9 roster. And then you step into that bottom lane and I think it's finally, that's where the lights are on big time for Cloud9 and are shining super bright because Berserker is playing a lot like that Berserker, the number one ADC in the region. And Vulcan has combined to be pretty darn well in lane and a well outside of lane aspect that we know that he brings to the game and brings to the Rift. This has been Cloud9 at full throttle. And that's why that series combined with FlyQuest eking out a game five against Team Liquid has them absolutely side by side for that winner's bracket matchup that we're going to get later in the LCS playoffs. Then you have two top 10 squads from last week and for the last few weeks uh, in IG and D+. Obviously D+, that lost to Kwangdong. They're on a losing streak, but the other games were from T1 and Gen G, so slightly more forgivable. It's an understandable losing streak in that type of one. And I think the, you know, how competitive and where they fell and fell short in those ones against Titans like T1 and Gen G is where you get this understanding and leniency towards the, the result that happens from the They had avenues field. to, you know, both T1 series, they were ahead early. They had some really positive moments where they could have won that Gen G series. So 
stepping stones, right, for this D-plus team to find a way to contend, to be a threat, especially as we move towards playoffs and you're realizing about best of scenarios and what you can do in that situation. The question mark for D-plus is always going to be someone like Lucid in the jungle in this position and how he is filling in in comparisons, of course, unfairly to someone like Canyon and what he did for his legacy with this organization. It all starts here, this type of road, the big time pressure moments where Canyon really showed what type of skill, what type of difference he had as a jungler compared to his opponent. This is where I want Lucid to step up and really show another avenue for D plus Kia. A lot to ask from a young player. But, but he, he showed he signs of it. He showed signs Absolutely. of it with the Lee Sin performances. Those were his best games that he's had this split by far, uh, even though D plus didn't come away with those wins. The new, the new kids on the block in the top 10 are the Black and Gold Fnatic in EU. Not only do they take down their main rivals in G2, but they completely embarrassed them and made it look like a scrim. Holy cow, did they ever, I don't know, there's got to be something where I'm almost unable to believe in this type of destruction of G2 from Fnatic because even when we get an El Clasico between these two and it does go into a good type of pattern, Normally, you don't get one going head and shoulders above the others like this, and that is exactly the performance that we saw from Fnatic. And I want to highlight my man, Mr. Razork, in the jungle. This has been the split, I think, of Razork for Fnatic. Last split, mostly about Humanoid. I think this one's really about Razork and how he has been able to take over in that jungle. And I think that his, his commands, his pathing, and what he wants to do, that's got to be the path that Fnatic is following down for success. And a little bit of a dip in Yikes' performance early on in this split. Razork is clearly on the top of that jungle chain in the LEC right now. KT Rolster climbing is a bit of a complicated one. They play a competitive two-game set, or two games against Hanma before they fall uh, into game three. But they've been looking better as of late. I know they needed a game three against DRX. But we're seeing the rebound and the trajectory change for KT. Yeah, I think this has been... Uh, absolutely one of those ones where they maybe were limit testing the bottom of where they find themselves out in the LCK. And I think right now, comfortably, it is that five to three zone. That is where you're at. That's where you're finding yourself right now. This week, you're in that fourth slot. You're right in the middle because you are just slightly ahead of a squad like D plus Kia that has had some ups and downs. And then you look ahead of you at a squad like Honda Life, which is starting to reach up, starting to prime themselves to make that attack against the top two teams in Gen G and T1. A squad like KT, BDD keeps heating it up, keeps providing these crucial ultimates for the team. I can absolutely see them contending and pushing a team like Hanwha Life as we move into the playoff territory. Yeah, but right now Hanwha is knock, knock, knocking on that top five with a T1 series win. Follow that up with that dominant game three against KT. They are closest than ever they have been for uh, that top five spot for them. They kind of swap spots with G2 because they get dismantled by Fnatic and kind of unfairly to G2. Their bounce back game is against Giant X, so not that impressive, you know. Sorry, you're, you're not. X. You're really not getting points on the scorecard for the Giant X victory. It is one of those unfortunate ones due to it. I think obviously the performance and, and mental bounce back was there from G2. Good things to see, good things to keep track of. Of course, if you're G2, you're going to brush it off. You're going to say, I don't care about losing a regular season game to Fnatic. Wake me up when they're challenging us, really making a sweat in a best of scenario for one of these important parts later on, which we know. I'm pretty darn sure the, the, the script writers have got that scheduled up for us from the LEC. Yeah, and let's be honest, they haven't been challenged much in like a year and a half. So 100% fair that they're feeling that way. Staying locked in that seven spot is fun. Plus Phoenix, we talked about it. They got a pretty easy schedule to close things out. Look on track for maybe a 12 win regular season, which again, absolutely nobody had on the docket. And against Rare Adam, Milky Way was the pedestrian because Mr. Pear got to, or Mr. Care got to pilot the Aurelian Soul. Oh man, this is a different angle from FPX seeing Care on the Aurelian Soul and popping off like that is something else to keep thinking about when you look at this roster. Now, is that the expectation? of what is gonna be the power, where you're gonna be finding the resources put in for the FPX team. I don't think that's where we're gonna expect it moving forward, but it is a good sign to see good thing moving forward. And as you mentioned, this is that back half of the scheduling for FPX where they've already done the hard work. They've already had 
the hard schedule time come through. Now it's easy street as you coast into these playoffs on this run. We're still seeing the execution at a high level, which is one of those things you want to see from one of these teams. Maybe you would have seen them, oh, we're going to slip in performance. We're going to go down to the level of our opponent type of thing. That's not what we have seen. We have seen this FPX team hold strong and true. Milky Ways, as you mentioned, pedestrian. But that is a good sign because if he's a normal thing and everybody else is popping off, we know the strength of this team when Milky Way is popping off. That is the big key. you got to be banning Rumble from life pretty much every game now as that pocket pick whenever playoffs do roll around for FPX. Despite the big, impressive week and a half from Hanwha Life, it's still the same top five. Obviously, JDG head-to-head -head win against top esports means they take back that number four spot. I'm still not convinced TES is the better team and in a best of five might come away with a win, but that's just me. Yeah, I, I need to see it, is what I want to say about that one in that type of series. I, like you mentioned, Hanwha Life, man, there, there's almost nothing. There's one sliver, the only last thing, the impossible task of a Gen G. That's what's left in front of you if you want to be able to claim this type of top spot for Hanwha Life. They're not going to have an opportunity for that. They're going to have to wait for the playoff situation to play themselves out and get themselves any further up. As you already laid out, the LPL squads that are ahead of them. And that's the big thing right now. Because if you want to enter into this top five dance, you got to be in that type of category. And well, we've already got two of them operated by the LCK and the LPL ain't going anywhere. So you got to find a way to separate yourself. And right now, these LPL squads, JDG, top esports as you laid out, they're holding on strong. Really what this top five is doing now is the separation is the top two. T1 drops that series to Hanwha. They have to go against the absolute raid boss. That's like maxing the difficulty and all the attributes in an ARPG when you have to take down a 12-kill smolder at 45 minutes. That was absolutely insane to watch. I mean, look, I'm, I'm used to losing my mind at seeing like a 300 stack smolder. I don't think I've ever seen a 600 plus stack smolder. That I don't want to see else. one ever again. Nope. No, I don't ever want to see that again. And thankfully, yes, the patches are coming in sooner rather than later for this one on Smolder to get it under control a little bit. T1, they've lost control of being in that top two spots of this power ranking list because of the way things have gone. Of course, the, they're a little bit of a loss, a little bit of a slip up, these type of things where they're not quite perfect. Gen G has remained perfect. And so has pretty much BLG. The way that you look at the through the two of them running away at the very front as the elite squads of the world. BLG, this bot lane, I'm putting them ahead of even Ruler and Missing right now in the LPL. They're getting up some ludicrous, like almost 50 CS and taking a turret and it's not even 10 minutes. Like the, the game is over. I think that part of that has played into the fact of, you know, someone like Knight stepping into the team and what either he's doing in his lane or how he's bringing those advantages over to your lane to get you ahead is one of the big things I want to talk about with that one. Because, yes, I think Ruler individually is back at that type of level. I think missing is maybe a little bit down, but that's part of how the whole situation, the whole structure was working with Knight on JDG. And, of course, 369 up in the top side is a big factor as well. You're looking at what you're rolling with with BLG and my man Elk has really taken those strides as being one of these top carries, one of these elite carries in the LPL. And it still kind of feels like both Bin and Knight haven't been doing their normal levels of pop-off and we're sitting here talking about a team that's 14 and 1. It almost feels like you've gotten kind of like 8 out of 10s, maybe 7.5 out of 10 performances from Knight and from, you know, Ben. I think maybe, maybe we got one 9 out of 10 from Knight. I'll give him that type of credit in that situation. But they've just been about what you expect on average type of thing. None of the big pop-offs, and it has all worked so well. The sum of its parts for BLG is that elite squad that sits just one spot away from the top spot in the global power rank. Yeah, but Genji... Not even that impressive because they can't even set a game score record this year. They they can only finish 34 wins, 5 losses. The record was 35 wins and 5 losses. So this is a lost season for them, right? And uh, yeah, Arnold's not going to be bringing around the chocolate bars this time around for the boys. Not setting out a record like this. It's crazy and it almost feels unfair. But given the success and the continued success of this organization and of a lot of these core players, you're looking at it and you're going... Okay, this is all great, 
But you got to do it when it counts, when it matters in some of these big later international knockout rounds. That's the big thing. And that's the only way Gen G is really going to prove themselves to the haters right now that aren't seeing themselves as that number one team in the world. You might be hoping as a Gen G fan, maybe they drop a series in the playoffs. Maybe T1 gets the best of them in the LCK so that the hype retracts a little bit and they can refocus heading into an international event and say, okay, we're not completely indestructible within the LCK. We got some things to fix when it comes to international because the recipe of winning every single LCK split hasn't amounted to good performances at Worlds or MSI. That is the big ticket and that is the big demand because again, when you look at a team like T1, it didn't, rem it didn't matter about that top end success in the LCK, which of course was a byproduct of being that successful team on the international stage was the big thing and where they made that difference, where they made themselves a threat regardless of that first seed, fourth seed, whatever type of situation. Never mind a fourth seed T1. Don't put that into any type of mojo of existing in the world. Yikes, we don't want that one. But it is crazy and it is one of those ones where, again, it's going to come down to you got to put up when the money is up for a team like Gen G. The money ain't up just for domestic championships. It's about that international success now. And how about one more shout out? Listen, BLG put in another historic regular season run. All they did in the offseason was add night, which is going to be a net positive on almost any team in the world. Gen G swapped out three entirely new players, and here they are almost setting another record in the regular season. It really is crazy to think about and, and to see that level of success stabilized through for this Gen G team, and especially when you're looking at Gen G. Yes, you're bringing in a big name like Keen. But Keen hasn't always delivered to that big name that he has established for himself in the LCK community and even internationally. So to get what they've gotten from him, to be able to bring Canyon over from D plus all the way into here and how well he has fit right in. Yes, this is a Gen G team that is doing wonderful things. They do deserve their respect, but I think there is going to be that split. There's going to be the people that have been burned too many times by Chovy and his crew to put that faith in them. And there's going to be the people that are always the believers, that it's always going to come through this one it's due. But they got the Canyon buff internationally, where he seems to level up when the games matter the most. So who knows what the future will be for this Gen G, but right now they're number one on the list, and that is it today. For League Unlock, Eric and Mark here with you, Beauty. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.